Hello men, I'd like to thank you for your work in our uh, spiritual formation class, Spiritual Dynamics, TH804. This is Dr. Mappus welcoming you to my home office here in Clark Summit, Pennsylvania. I wanted to share a bit with you about the Keswick Movement. Uh, the Keswick Movement is different than Methodism, which was a denomination, or Reformed Thinking, or the Pentecostal Movement, which again was a denomination. But the Keswick movement was trans-denominational. It drew uh, men and women and boys and girls from really all over the world. Uh, for years before seminary, I called it Keswick, but the W is not pronounced. It's Keswick, and it's called Keswick because Keswick was a town in northern England. So beginning in 1875, believers began to gather there, evangelical believers, and they had a week of Bible study, a week of prayer, a week of contrition, a uh, week of camping together, and they began to um, talk about how an ineffective Christian be could, could become effective. In other words, how could a Christian who is, uh, and I'll draw here on our graph, how could a Christian who's kind of living down here, and you've seen this many times, how could they get up here and start to grow? That was the concern. Now, when we talk about an ineffective Christian down here, we're not talking about someone who's living in deep, deep sin or someone who's denying the orthodoxy of the Christian faith. We're just talking about nominal churchgoers who thinks that there's something more to life and something more to Christianity than going to church and praying and confessing Christ. And our churches today, by the way, are filled with these people. So the Keswick movement had an answer from how to get from here to up here. And each movement has an answer, don't they? So if you're Pentecostal, you have to have the baptism of the Spirit. Okay? If you're Augustinian Dispensational, which is next week, uh, they had a particular idea. But if you're Keswick, they had a particular uh, emphasis in theology that they focused on to... to move from being ineffective to the effective Christian. I have a, a handbill uh, that was promoted back in um, 1901, and it says this. Uh, this is a promotion to draw people to a conference. Immediate abandonment of every known sin and doubtful indulgence. Think about that. In other words, if you want to abandon every known sin, and doubtful indulgence come to this conference. Uh, another, another one would be appropriation by faith of God's promise and power for holy living. Another would be gracious renewal or transformation of the innermost temper and disposition. Now, before we criticize the, the Keswick movement, uh, I would say I wish today in our churches that we had more emphasis on spiritual renewal the emphasis today seems to be on um, uh, connecting everybody, uh, some political issues, uh, church growth through a CEO mentality. I, do, I don't see the emphasis today uh, in our churches for spiritual renewal. And that's what the Keswick movement was about. So it started in 1875, and you had groups of people that camped together for a week of Bible conferences. And they ate together, they prayed together. And they tried to address this question, how can I be an effective Christian? How can I experience all that God wants for me? Now, I want to pause for a moment and ask you a question. I want to envision, I want you to envision yourself uh, at a camp. You've been there all week, perhaps as camp pastor. Maybe there's several hundred people there from all different uh, fellowships, denominations. And towards the end of that camp, you have 30 people come to you from your church, 30 people. Some are single, some are married, some are teenagers, some are children. They come to you and they, they say they want to be all that God wants them to be. And they say, we'll do anything you ask us to do, Pastor. Tell us how we can experience the love of Christ to the fullest extent. Now, what would you tell them? You know they're believers. There's not known deep sin in their lives. They want to know how they can experience 
Christ to the fullest extent. They want to move from here to up here. They want to experience sustained victory over sin. What would you tell them? What would you tell them? Well, if you're Pentecostal, we know what you would tell them. If you're Kazakh, what would you tell them? Let me show you a picture of this uh, promotion in 1901. Um, I'll just put it up here on the camera. What would you tell them? What must they do? You see, we, we, we tend to substitute real solutions just for restatements of principle, don't we? We say, well, you got to live like Jesus. And they say, well, how do we do that? What do we need to do to live like Jesus? Well, you need to be like Christ. Or you need to be filled with the Spirit. The Kazakhs found a very kind of a practical way to address the ineffective Christian. It was never a sustained, systematic theology. They took a truth of Scripture and they applied it to their historical uh, situation in Christianity. Think with me. You had the, the rise of Methodism and, and the Wesleyan movement where you could arrive to a point where you could not sin. So they said. Obviously, that didn't work out. Eventually, that movement was measured by experience and it wasn't working. As Methodism was decreasing, you had the rise of the holiness movement. The holiness movement said, well, you could reach a point where the sin nature was completely eradicated. So that was their solution. From the holiness movement came the Pentecostal movement. Well, as the holiness movement was descending, we had the rise of the Keswick movement. And we owe a debt of gratitude toward, to the Keswicks. Uh, some, of the, some of the Keswicks, let me just read you some of the uh, very famous ones. Donald Barnhouse, F.B. Meyer, H.C.G. Mule, Andrew Murray, John Scott. Okay, those guys were reformed. Hudson Taylor, R.A. Torrey. They all claimed to be somewhat Keswick in their thinking. And the Keswick movement, uh, as it developed, the, they had a five-day conference. Day one was focusing on sin and disabling uh, of the believer. Day two was focusing on God's provision to the cross and through Christ. Day three was uh, focused on consecration, surrender, and crisis. And day four was focused on living the Spirit-filled life. And eventually then, day five became a focus on full-time Christian ministry. So many of the mission agencies were built because of the Keswick influence. One famous word. If you're Keswick, you should think of one word. What is the word? You should be thinking of one word if you're Keswick. And that is surrender. So their solution to moving from here to up here to experience the sustained, victorious Christian life was surrender. You need to surrender yourself to Christ. And it would not be uncommon at a Keswick conference to have people come up to you and say, have you surrendered? Have you surrendered yet to the Lord? Have you surrendered? Have you surrendered? And ultimately, that surrender was measured by full-time Christian service. If you were really surrendered, then you would go into full-time Christian ministry and the ultimate surrender would be a missionary. And that drove uh, much of the Western evangelical thinking of, of missions. We owe a debt of gratitude to Keswick thinking. And I'm not, uh, I'm not a Keswick in the, the classic sense here. They had a right truth. I think they just overemphasized it. Because what happened was the Keswick's so emphasized this, this surrender right here, this surrender right here, this surrender, that they, they claimed it was a one-time event. They, they said you have to have that one-time act when you surrender your will to the Lord Jesus Christ. And once you do that, then you're on your path to sustained victory in Christian living. And I tend to think not. I tend to think that we 
surrender ourselves every moment of every day, sometimes every second of every day in certain situations. But the Keswick said, well, you have to start with that one-time surrender. And they really emphasize that, that once you, once you make that surrender, once you give yourself to Christ fully, then you'll have sustained victory and certainly you will continue to surrender yourself. And I think like anything, um, any movement, it, it eventually wore, it, wore itself down because you had people who surrendered themselves, but then they didn't sustain uh, a life of, of Christian victory. So I, I, wanna, I want us to be uh, careful in our critique of them. It's not a denomination, and it's not really a theological construct. All the other movements are really a, are denominations of a theological construct. The Keswick, the Keswick idea started by, by trying to help people become effective in their Christian experience. Through, through song, through prayer, through Bible study, and ultimately through surrender. So going back to my question, what would you say to a group of parishioners, 30 parishioners in your church, who, who come to you and say, we'll do anything. We want, we want to be whatever God wants us to be. We want to have the fullest expression, experience of Christ. What would you say? Uh, the Keswick's would say, well, you've got to surrender first. You've got to surrender your life to Christ. And they were right. They were right to say that. But they were wrong to emphasize that it was just a one-time single, single kind of event. Oh, uh, man, we, uh, we surrender ourselves to Christ moment by moment, not just a, a one-time event. Well, I want you to read the material carefully. I'm not sure everybody's getting the import of these uh, positions. Be sure to look at the PowerPoint slides, and I hope the video is helpful to you. We, again, owe a debt of gratitude to the Keswick's. And when we look at charts like this, we're not suggesting that these individuals have denied the Christian faith, and we're not suggesting they're living in some deep, deep kind of sin. They're just not experiencing sustained victory. So what do you do with them? What do you tell them? How do you help them? Sometimes people do need to be brought to a point where they surrender whatever it is they're struggling with to the Lord Jesus. So I want you to be thinking about your, your view of sanctification. Uh, eventually you're going to write that, so I want you to be thinking about your view. Um, next week, we look at the Augustinian dispensational view. Now, let me just say, that's not a very good title for that view. Um, had I been the editor... I would have not allowed John Walbert to use that title. I would have said, let's call it the John Walbert view, or the old Dallas Seminary view, or the um, Ryrie view. It has really little to do with dispensationalism as a theological system. So you can, you, you, you can be a dispensationalist and deny what those men are saying. The reason that they allowed them to call it that view is because at that time Dallas was known as the premier dispensational institution and John Walbert was the president. So that's how he got away from that. If you really want to know the, the, the issues, you, you need to carefully read the exchanges between Hokema, who is one of my favorite reformed guys, and Walbert. Those two guys are like two big battleships. You know, they're just banging away at one another. They are the big guns in this book. So if you can kind of really uh, wrestle and think through what those men are saying, the other positions will tend to, I think, line up. Hope you're enjoying the course. Uh, hope you're enjoying the class. I want you to know I pray for you. And um, I hope that, uh, hope that the Lord's working in your life. So... With that, I'll say goodbye, and I hope everyone has a, a great day.
great week.